Hello, and welcome to New York Theatre Barn's New Work Series. I'm Joe Barros, and I'm the Artistic Director. Hello, and I'm Jen Sandler, and I'm the Associate Artistic Director. It's Wednesday night, and I'm coming to you live from the Fire Island Pines. And I am coming to you live from my home in Hell's Kitchen. This is the last week I can teach Joe about being at the beach, and I am not, <laughs> because next week he comes back to New York City. Um, it's well, always a thing. She's always jealous of me, but and it's, it's okay. fun. I, you know, and this is all in good fun. I'm excited for him to be back here. But tonight, it's not about us. Tonight, it is about shows, and we're excited to present excerpts from the new musicals *A Crossing* and *Forget Me Not*. Absolutely. Again, that was *A Crossing* and *Forget Me Not*, and this is the seventeenth virtual installment of our new work series. And that means we have presented 38 in musicals and 64 writers in counting since March at no cost to our global audience. That's right, 38 new musicals and 64 writers. And tonight's broadcast will also be simulcast to Broadway On Demand. Yes, and all of the artists who have participated in our virtual programming have donated their time and talent. And because of all these artists, we have been able to keep theater and the development of new musicals alive during this unusual time. Yes, and over the span of 17 weeks, more than 51 million Americans have filed unemployment claims across the country. That's 15% of the U.S. population who are now out of a job. And so we want to urge government leaders to extend pandemic unemployment assistance, and we need your help. Yes, as we said last week, please join us in signing the petition to extend COVID-19 emergency unemployment assistance through December 31st, 2020. And we've included on our YouTube link a bio, our bio to the petition for move on to sign and any anything helps, honestly. And I also wanted to show you guys, um, me and Alexandra Silver, my good friend, created Artists Are the Essential Workers of Tomorrow Merchandise. All of the profits are going to the Actors Fund to help all of the essential workers who are the true essential workers of the theater industry who need our help more than ever. And we have notebooks, shirts, um, so many different things and anything you give will go directly to the pockets of the people that need it most. So we have a link to that as well in our YouTube description and we hope you can support us. Sounds like there's some drama going on in Midtown. I hear that siren. Mm, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Jen. Uh, we need to look out for each other during these unprecedented times. So please, let's help each other and those who are most in need. Mm -hmm. New York Theatre Barn is actively seeking out and curating important culture shifting stories that we don't know from storytellers that we want to hear from. And because of this, our board of directors and staff have been meeting to discuss ways for our organization to further develop anti-racist culture. We have carefully and thoughtfully chosen and dedicated 50% of our donations each week since the beginning of June to a different charity that supports black lives and civil rights. And here to tell us more about this initiative and New York Theater Barn is our newest board member, Adam Ray Siegel. Hi there, my name is Adam Ray Siegel and I am the newest member of New York Theater Barn's board of directors coming to you from Bushwick. As a theater industry professional who strives to spotlight stories and performers that are unconventional, I am proud to be part of a creative home that makes space for all artists and new culture-shifting musicals during incubation. A little about myself, I produce major fundraising events for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, like the Fire Island Dance Festival and Hudson Valley Dance Festival, as well as off-Broadway productions like Beyond Babel and The Other Side. I'm also an FDNY licensed fire performer. Tonight, the New York Theatre Barn family is excited about two new musicals, A Crossing and Forget Me Not. These are two powerful stories from four musical theatre writers we want to hear from. Zoe Sarnak, Mark St. Germain, Joey Contreras, and Kate Thomas. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and your gift is tax deductible. We need your help to continue to support artists. This week, Half of our donations will go to support Campaign Zero, a comprehensive platform of research-based policy solutions to end police brutality in America. We are also proud to fiscally sponsor Claim Our Space Now, an organization dedicated to emboldening urgent action to dismantle white supremacy and save black lives. Thank you for supporting live theater and enjoy the show. And I just want to give a shout out. We, you know, we were saying support artists. You know, I saw Diana Huey on our chat already, who's now after tonight been in three of our digital new works. Um, I saw the great Brian Russell Carey on our chat, who is married to Joey Contreras, and he just was in 
um, our presentation in February, which was our last new work series in person. So we love artists and we have to support them. Absolutely, and thank you to Adam, who's now a member of our board, who tunes in almost every week, and now he's on the broadcast um, doing amazing things. So thank you so much, Adam. We are so excited to support Campaign Zero. Yes, and we are also excited to support next week's charity, which is A Long Walk Home. A Long Walk Home empowers young artists and activists to end violence against all girls and women. A Long Walk Home also advocates for racial and gender equity in schools, communities, and our country at large. Last week's Newark series featured the new musicals Americano and Ten. Here is a clip from last week's presentation of Americano. Take a look. The Phoenix Theatre Company believes the arts are essential because they foster the hero within. I love that. Creating a greater understanding of cultural and political differences. So it seems fitting that a border state theatre company would tell a story about a dreamer, a young undocumented immigrant, who was brought to the United States as a child. So we took on the subject of uh, DACA because that was becoming a very hot topic, topic in um, Arizona. Searching the internet, long story short, we found um, Tony's story. The story that we are telling is about a dreamer from Phoenix, Arizona. You're going to leave thinking. We knew we needed to have original music and we definitely felt like it was extraordinarily important to have a Hispanic, Latino um, voice. Ultimately, we found Carrie uh, Rodriguez in the hospital. Hearing Tony's story was so moving. Um, you know, what, what Tony has managed to do with his life, um, dealing with so many limitations without that documentation, it's just incredible. Um, and I was it is, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, telling this human story to people from all sides of the political spectrum and hopefully moving people. It's just incredible. I was blown away how the art could really capture a true moment that happened in my life that I would have never thought I could experience again. And, and, and again, it being in front of an audience. Just found out that he is not an American citizen and that his parents had not shared this information with him, so. But this is my home, my heart and my soul. Who's to say this great country I vow to defend is no longer my own. I'm not alone, my roots are so All I've ever known is I'm an American. This is my really special show. I think it's a really propitious time for a show like Americano. And Absolutely. A really special team. So here's a clip from last week's presentation of 10. Take a look. Simple, which is I started writing it uh, my junior year of college. And so I initially I was like, oh, I just I became obsessed with him and with his memoirs. And the more I read up on him and read his work, I just sort of fell in love with him. And um, and actually, my initial impulse was to write a show where he's super old and near death and looking back. Um, and it was a talk with a uh, professor, mentor of mine, early on, who was like, why would you do that when <laughs> this is where you are in your life and you can speak so immediately to this feeling of something's coming, something's coming, something's coming, and I don't know what it's going to be. But again, I made an impossible wish that tonight I'll go to sleep with one less shame to keep. And as a gay man, uh, or I should say as a queer man in today's world, I just, it really, these songs really resonated with me and I just really felt, wow, this story hasn't been told and it needs to be told. And I think you're telling it in a really special, unique way. Thank you. There's so much I can't say that's trying to break free. I'm praying for potions, for spells, for charms. I've made an impossible wish. I've made an impossible wish. I've made an impossible wish that tonight I'll go to sleep. A secret still to keep. And tomorrow when I wake up and I look around and see you there, I won't give a shit about you're on. Yeah, I mean, and this, I mean, to the point of queerness, I mean, that was what drew me to Tennessee 
like unquestionably it was picking up his memoir and realizing how completely unabashedly gay he was in a time where that was just not a thing that a never mind a like cult figure might be but a like mainstream nationally recognized playwright would be writing about his hookups and and so this song is uh is basically about the sort of neuroses that drove Tennessee to write. And he he referred to them in his journals as Blue Devils. There is power in a blank page. There is power in a long and lonesome night. So you can drown us out in blind rage. Or you can drop us in the things you write. Another sip, another bug boy. That show is so special. And I know Julian is at the Rhinebeck Writers Retreat right now virtually, and we can't wait to see what happens with it there. Absolutely. So now let's get started. Our first musical tonight is A Crossing. Created in association, in association with Cal Poly Mexican Dance Company, the new musical A Crossing has a book by Mark St. Germain, music and lyrics by Zoe Sarnak, and is directed and choreographed by Joshua Burgos. Pulsing with energy and emotional intensity, this story about a group of migrants crossing the Mexican-American border is raw, visceral, and electrifying, demonstrating the personal impact of crossing an invisible line. The new dance musical ingeniously combines compelling lyrics, athletic choreography, and elements of Mexican folk music to tell a remarkable tale of courage, fear, and struggle. And now joining us from their homes are members of the creative team of A Crossing, Zoe Sarnak, Joshua Burgos, George Sines, and, uh, and George Sines. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Hello, guys. Hi. Hi. It's Thanks so good to see of you. Um, well, let's dive right in. Uh, I'm so glad that, uh, you know, we have a writer here. We have a member of, of the team that is a part of creating this and also the director and choreographer. So, hey, Josh, you've been a part of this show since its inception. The work you create is consistently innovative, incredibly eclectic, and you show such versatility in your physical storytelling. Uh, your work also tends to empower actors and dancers in that your work is highly actor driven. Tell us about uh, the journey in assembling this team and what inspired you to tell the story as a musical. Uh, well, thanks for the kind words. Um, uh, so I, I, it was probably about five or six years ago where I was just thinking, what do I wanna do? What's, what's my next thing? And, and both my, my parents are immigrants. My mother is, um, you know, she was, they, they were survivors from World War II and she, she lived in a refugee camp for five years before they came to the States. My father came here as a teenager from Brazil. And I decided uh, that's what I want to do. I want to tell a story about immigrants. And so I called up uh, Julie Boyd at Barrington Stage and asked her if she wanted to do this with me. And, and I wanted to do this like I had really, I wanted to tell as much of the story in dance as possible. And she said, you know, she's, she, totally, she totally jumped on board. And I met with Mark St. Germain and we started to develop the story. And then, um, uh, and then Zoe came on board and we started to figure out what the sound was. Cause I, you know, I heard, I heard some music of hers and it was so character driven and so beautiful. And, but yet I, I mean, I wanted to dance to it so much. Uh, so, so I, I, I talked her into joining this crazy thing. <laughs> and, um, and then, and then I was researching um, Mexican folk dance and folk music, and and I came across this amazing uh, Mexican folk dance, Cal Poly, folk dance company, and and um, and then met with them, and somehow talked them into joining me on this journey. Um, so that's kind of where we that's that, that's how we all got together. Uh, and we've, we've done already one, one workshop, one lab, 
And we were supposed to do a production at Barrington Stage this past summer. It's been pushed to next summer. Um, but we're planning on doing another workshop, hopefully, before then. So that's kind of been the journey of, of this and, and how all these super talented people have gotten together. So basically, it sounds like Josh, you're just really good at convincing people to work with you. That's how <laughs> well, this all started. <laughs> so Zoe, let's talk about the music then. Once Josh got you involved, how did that music kind of start and how did you figure out how you wanted to write the show? Well, I think um, for me, uh, I similarly um, come from, fam I'm first generation as well. and um, and so I felt like very emotionally connected to uh, the story. And yet, you know, I felt strongly that um, although I could connect to the characters we were like developing in, in certain ways, I also wanted to make sure that I was um, taking this moment to be sort of a, a part of a team where I was bringing certain storytelling elements and then hearing like the number of, folk songs that George has sent to me that I, I would never have known, or um, even just thinking about the orchestration and in instrumentations that we've bounced back and forth. Um, we sort of, in some ways, created a world of sound that feels to me um, like organically, like music and lyrics that I've written, and also take totally like a new pocket um, that I'm really grateful to have gotten to explore. So. Um, in that sense, the music is built, the hope is to um, to weave together sounds that we think of as, you know, traditional uh, Mexican folk music and also um, contemporary, uh, like even Americana, um, the, the framing device of the piece actually leads into Americana and then blending these sounds, you know, as we're telling a story of, of a border that is, as we sort of, we end up talking about a, an invisible border, you know? Wow, and George, you know, Cal Poly got involved in what has been the influence of dance in this show specifically with you. Well, with us, uh, we've uh, kind of been able to, to lead the team into certain directions that we think would bring authenticity to the story uh, and to what you're seeing on stage. Um, and I think that was one of the most important things in our collaboration was being able to agree on a, on, on not only styles of dance but almost like a like a a feeling uh, something that you can always uh, for example uh, something as simple as a traditional Mexican tune uh, of the more traditional the better is is a good way on kind of maintaining this type of feeling like a vibe. Uh, when you hear that, you are constantly reminded of, of a lot of the struggles that a lot of the people go through and also a lot of uh, the, the wonderful things that happen. And a lot of the Mexican folk music is uh, spawned out of pain and joy, most like most folk, uh, folk music. And that's one thing that's very useful uh, in, in trying to create uh, these kind of emotions. Uh, and I was happy to be able to help uh, along with Alberto Lopez as well. Uh, his contribution uh, comes from everything from uh, when it comes to the, the traditional Mexica dance, from the Aztec warrior dances. And uh, he has extensive knowledge uh, of when it comes to the choreography and the style of music from that. So uh, I've been lucky to I have been able to perform that music live with Galpuli, music as obscure as even Aztec drumming, uh, which is called Mexica. And it's something that you that I haven't really seen on the contemporary stage, uh, especially here in the United States. So we're kind of glad that we were able to um, uh, present those types of art forms. And that way it kind of seeped into the show. And uh, that's one of the examples of how we were kind of able to help out. Awesome, awesome. I, I think we're really excited for everybody to see the work that you have all created uh, through your collaboration. Um, and what I think I would say Jen and I really love about Zoe's work is that it's melodic, it's it's deep, but it's also every song is like a one-act play. There's, su there's such intricacy inside of it. And I think you'll totally feel that. So Zoe, why don't you set up the first song for us? Sure. Um, so uh, this first song is um, early in the show. 
and it's sung by our lead, Giselle. And she's a 15 year old um, who is about to take this uh, journey with her grandfather, her abuelo, um, because her parents were killed by the cartel. And, and, and he um, makes the decision that they're gonna cross the border. But um, she, like any good teenager, is like not so thrilled about it. Um, and in, in a beautiful way, she, I, I felt really connected to this kind of um, first love that she has, that she's being forced to leave and um, like earnestly and authentically believes is, is it, you know, as a 15 year old, which is kind of amazing. And, um, and her journey as our protagonist is sort of the, has the most twists and turns and sort of, um, but it's important that she starts from a place where she's actually like not convinced that this is the right thing. And when she sings from like this rebellious place, I thought, you know, what this is a moment to weave in some of um, my kind of like a little bit re rebellious rock roots. Um, so uh, this is the moment in the town square where um, her grandfather is with the coyote and, and paying him. And so she has a moment alone and she um, gets to express this kind of, um, not just her trepidation, but maybe like her frustration as well. And uh, it'll be sung by um, Ashley Perez Flanagan, who's amazing um, and not 15, but I think she's <laughs> pulling it off. <laughs> Let's take a look. Time is up, we gotta go Say goodbye to everything we know I'm off seat, don't know Time to slow down Life changes in a blink Just a kid, so trust it's for the best now Just a kid, so listen, don't protest now But I've seen my parents lead to rest So now I'm feeling older than you think And you say the journey's just a few days You see it's worth every mile But I've seen the truth, I've seen it for a while Sneak in the dark of night If we'll all be fine Would they tell us to wait in line Push paper for lifetime If they really wanted us We could walk across the border in broad daylight So say it with me now Say it with me now With dignity Oh, I don't want nobody who don't want me At home, at least I had a love. You can laugh and call it puppy love. But my parents met when they were young, and that love would have been forever. And you say it's only for a few years, and soon I'll meet somebody new. Shelter, try time and time again If it's worth it then Would they separate mother and child Kept in holding pens If they really wanted us We could walk across the border Two arms wide open Say it with me now Say it with me now With dignity I don't want nobody Who don't want me
God, I'm snapping to that right now. So good. Thanks, friends. Thanks to Ashley, because she's so good. So talk to her. And I just want to shout out our great friend, Jakob Reinhardt, who's doing all your mixing. It's yes. one, he told me he's watching. It's almost 1.30 in Germany for him, but. You're a rock star. Also, Jak has put up with so, because the two of us have worked together Same. on many things, and he, he puts he puts up with me like being like, wait, could the staff be pitched like <laughs> just a bit higher? And he's like, so you're crazy. But oh, then, he's, you know, he's our rock star better. producer, guitarist, just like wonderful person. So I have to shout him totally. out. Totally, totally. Awesome. Well, while, while we're on a roll, let's 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 hear another song. Tell us about it. Uh, sure. And you know, Josh, if I'm explaining this in any confusing way, feel free to jump in. But so as as we've talked about, it's a dance piece. Um, we think of it like as a dance musical theater hybrid. Um, and so one of the conventions that we use is we have um, storytellers who uh, sing us through certain um, action sequences and then there's like these larger dance numbers. So we're getting, um, we're getting like a narrator kind of experience as you're seeing the dance. And so certain characters are more voiced by the storytellers than um, vocally and then they, they are more dance heavy tracks. So one of those characters is the coyote. And um, another of our larger roles um, named Karina is a, a pregnant woman who's crossing alone. Um, we learn about her backstory and why she is. But for this scene, um, basically a relationship developed between her and the coyote that seems like a friendship um, in that he, I think, at first, like it seems like he's looking out for her a bit. Um, and then there is this scene that happens, oh, what, Josh, two thirds of the way through the show? Yeah, that's right. Um, and without going into too much detail about the journey of the song, um, they're in camp, uh, They he's pointing out some stars to her, they, they, they move into a clearing that's like um, calm, like away from the group and he's pointing out certain stars to her and they actually kind of have a bit of a nice moment um, and then this song begins. So it'll be, it's being sung by Robbie Hager and it would be sung by one of our um, storytellers while the coyote will be doing this dance like around uh, Karina. And um, then as the dance uh, continues, it starts to, the, the vibe of the scene starts to change. So um, it's sort of inspired by certain traditional um, love songs. Uh, and 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 then a sort of bit of a darker twist on it. And it, it was, I would add, it's really interesting because I thought Zoe was going to write something completely different. And then when she sent this song to me, it was so beautiful, and so and I could see how it could be so haunting and turn on itself. And so I'm incredibly excited to stage this and to choreograph this because um, yeah, it's very cerebral. Absolutely. Well, here is Robbie. Besarte es como ver las estrellas. Besarte es como ver las estrellas. Es distinta. I have sat resting beside. 
women not like you It's clear Esta noche es distinta I find my mouth is speaking Though it's not meant to I've never wanted anything like this before But I see your face lit softly and so gentle And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what stars are for Besarte es como ver las estrellas Besarte es como ver las estrellas Please don't cry Please don't be scared I see you're prepared for the worst Esta noche es distinta Know that I, I would take care Touch you right there at first Esta noche es distinta So soft, yes, I'll be gentle. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what stars are for. What stars are for. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what dark is for. Besarte es como ver las estrellas What dark is for Wow Beautiful I'm like, oh no <laughs> Every time I'm like, he did so well and I feel so upset And you um, can't be there in person <laughs> It was really fantastic. Uh, well, to wrap things up, we'd love to see some of the movement from the show. So I was lucky enough to be on Creative Teams with Josh on the Broadway revival of Gigi, the long-running off-Broadway production of Cagney, and workshops of King Kong. But Josh, I think, what makes this piece different from a lot of those other pieces? Oh, well, I mean, I, I don't know if we've mentioned it, but there's no dialogue in this piece. Yeah, um, we haven't. Yeah, there's, there's no dialogue. There are Zoe songs. There um, are Mexican folk music and there's dance, but there, there's no spoken dialogue. So all the storytelling is done with, with you know, those, those three things. Um, so it's, you know, it's certainly something new and different and, and original, I, I, I like to think. Um, and the, there's gonna be, a, you know, like I was saying, there's, there's gonna be a lot of dancing and a lot of story driven dancing. It's not just like, you know, there's going to not kick lines, but there's going to be huge amounts of uh, choreography that are going to propel the story forward and, and drive character and everything like that. Um, and, um, and I'm really excited about it. I don't know where Joe just went, but we're going to show you some <laughs> awesome dance. <laughs> Mothers, fathers, tears, almighty God, you see the danger, see our sons and daughters. Oh, almighty God, please hear these words and guide us through the Very nice. So beautiful. <laughs>
Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your crossing with us. We are so excited about the production that will be happening at Barrington Stage next year. Um, and we can't wait for it. So thank you, George, Zoe, and Josh. And we'll see you guys thank you. soon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Um, there was a dog barking in the background and I just wanted to spare you the drama. Is the dog okay? He's totally fine. He it was an unexpected <laughs> visitor. You know, it's, it's live theater. You never know who's going to come <laughs> on stage. <laughs> and now <laughs> to the second half of our presentation, the new musical Forget Me Not. Loosely inspired by the 1970s Exploding Whale, which I've never heard of, and the Long Island serial killer Forget Me Not is an original musical with book and lyrics by Kate Thomas and music by Joey Contreras and solved murders, tender relationships, and a media frenzy leads to an explosive reveal that makes us wonder what we would do to keep from being forgotten. And now joining us from their homes are the writers of Forget Me Not, Kate Thomas and Joey Contreras. Hi guys. Hey. Hi. Where are you joining us from? I am in California right now. And I am in Brooklyn. Awesome. So we're in we're in two different time zones. Joey's yeah. in the past. We're in the we're in the present or the future, however you look at it. <laughs> How does the future look? <laughs> Joey, is that your mother-in-law? That is my mother-in-law. Hi Sue. Hi Sue. Hi Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> So excited that both Zoe and Joey, Zoe and Joey, they rhyme. Uh, that rhymes. Of New York Peter Barnes Glory Days. Um, back in the day, we presented um, your your work, both of you, because you're you're both such exciting writers. Um, and so we're thrilled to have you both here um, and now collaborating with Kate, which is super cool. So yeah. what drew you to the source material and what inspired you guys to tell the story? Sure. Um, so it actually started with the whale. <laughs> um, Kate and I were just kind of, uh, we had just finished writing another show and developing it. And we just were having one of those writer conversations about, okay, we want to we want to start a new piece. What do we want to say? What do we want to do? Is there anything that's been sort of in the back of our minds inspiring us? And I sort of in a lighthearted way had mentioned this story I'd heard about a, uh, a 45 foot eight ton whale that had washed ashore in Oregon back in the 70s and the town decided to explode it because they didn't know what to do with it. And um, they're actually, uh, they, they went through a, a bunch of different potential routes that included a lot of gruesome ideas um, and, and they ended up settling on attaching a bunch of dynamite and exploding it despite what the experts had recommended they do. And they figured that maybe then seagulls would help finish eating up the remaining parts. Um, and there's actually this really hilarious um, news piece on YouTube that you can find where a reporter is literally saying, everybody is running for their lives as whale guts are exploding all over the people in their cars. It's so wild and ridiculous. Um, and so I had mentioned to Kate, I was like, what if we wrote a, a, a musical about that? <laughs> but what uh, went from there was, all right, let's see uh, wh what an interesting like entry point into a town. Because then all of a sudden the questions are like, what is this town? What would make them do that? What is the psychology of this town? And, and Kate, um, her interests and where she really, what she really thrives in is kind of like the mysteries and the secrets um, behind a town and she loves that kind of stuff. So I'll pass the pass it over to Kate, but that's sort of the entry point of, of what started this piece. Right, so, so I mean, I guess I was like, oh, exploding whale, I'm totally in, but like, how does that work for two hours? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even know like what to do with that. Like just the image of whale guts, like I can't even fathom. Um, but there was something about it that's psychologically, again, it made us think, um, is there something behind that decision that's deeper, like that makes a community like so desperate to be seen that it prompts them to like, lean into that sort of choice. And so for us, we felt that this community needed to have perhaps like, you know, a brokenness about it, a past um, that was going to be revisited when the media came around to cover this whale. And so that led us to think, you know, what if a serial killer had targeted this area 10 years prior? And so that's where the inspiration of the Long Island serial killer case comes from. So 
forgotten women disappearing, being labeled missing, but they're actually murder victims. And then, you know, the only thing that finally initiates a real search or the discovery of the bodies is the elevation of one presumed victim in particular. And so in the case of our show, that one victim happens to be a white tourist who went missing on vacation near Forget Me Not. And so the search for her finally reveals the discovery of three local women of color who were murdered and who county law enforcement previously hadn't been concerned with. And so essentially our show kind of explores the toll that that sort of deep horrific negligence has taken on this community over the last decade and what that particular kind of grief and trauma does or further provokes that kind of grief without closure or justice because the cases were never solved, you know, and so how do you find peace in the face of a broken cheating system like that? Is peace even possible again? So all of that has kind of inspired us to write this kind of twisty thriller story and somehow we're trying to infuse like fuse an exploding whale into it so who knows if we're successful but right. um, yeah, that's, that's where we're living <laughs> yeah, what's interesting is that like because it's 10 years later the whale washes ashore and it's sort of like this moment of where um it's like an eerie echo of what happened 10 years prior of of, of um something washing up ashore and everything that kind of comes to surface again. And do you come across people that know this story? Cause I mean, I just, I'm even, I'm so fascinated with the show in general, but I've never heard of this story. And it's one I, you know, I wanted to know more about right away. Well, um, actually, uh, right at the start of this pandemic, um, there was a resurfacing of this story Wow. Uh, and basically saying, um, we should we should learn from this story of the exploding whale in Oregon and listen to the experts because the experts didn't, they did not listen to the experts when they exploded the whale. So she, we should listen to the experts when it comes to how to navigate this pandemic. And I was like, wow, that is such a, it's like- So totally random. <laughs> that's, that's like deep though. And it's, it's deep and like kind of a reach, but a reach that I, will respond to so yeah <laughs> yeah and it's still like percolating in the ether today like recently like i we found out that like i believe like in this part of oregon they've now like opened up this park that's called like exploding whale park and they're utilizing it as like a tourist attraction which is actually something we touch on in our show but it's like you know you just wonder with like certain communities like what what drives these attractions like what makes us like you know cling on to these things and in the media why why is an exploding whale more relevant than like some of the other stuff that doesn't get covered at all and so hey. these are all things that I guess interest us in our freaky deaky brains. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Ryder should take note that like weird, extraordinary, strange stories with rich conflict are what are are what are the stuff of musicals. So mm -hmm. it's like I'm like this is so cool, and I see a lot of a lot of blood in your marketing, which is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, and let's talk more about where has the show been so far, development wise. Um. We have done a collection of readings um, and a lot of development with um, universities, actually. Uh, NYU did a 29 hour. We did some our, our own 29 hours. And then Open Jar Institute and the Dare Tactic also did developmental um, workshops. Um, so yeah, that's where we are right now. And, um, and looking forward, we are hoping to get uh, another, you know, more of a stage lab done and um, maybe an interactive concert of some sort and secure some of the backing to move it with more concrete steps. Yeah, well, we have two exciting performances tonight. Do we want to talk about the first one? Yes, we do. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, first song that you're going to see is uh, performed by Kirsten Anderson and- um, Who we love. Who we love. Um, Amanda Lopez, Diana Huey, and Michael Williams. And uh, this song is the end of act one and uh, is essentially a reveal of one of the primary characters. Um, so we don't wanna give away too much because there's a lot of story and text that happens in this song, um, but it's sort of a, a huge moment where uh, you see how the intersection of all these different characters um, how how they have had involvement 
directly or indirectly to this uh, horrific thing that happened 10 years ago to this town. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's explored in this song. Awesome, well, here we go. Daddy dead and jobs and always a con. Me 14 and always the pawn. Cherry Vaseline dressed like a scream. Daddy said I looked like a little girl, little girl, little girl missing. Little girl, little girl, little girl, little girl missing. Daddy snapped a picture for TV, said go outside, baby hide in the park. Don't be scared of the dark. If I could hold out, he'd call 911. Said that money would buy a house big as the sun. So I walked into the night, in on the joke. Then a man with a smile offered me a Coke and told me I looked sad. I was, I was, I was mad. He gave me a ride, took a dive, half alive. I went underwater. Down to the depths, the blue never knew I would stay for so long. Underwater, I barely breathe, I'm lost with the cost of coming up for air. Is it worth it to me? Am I meant to be underwater? Disappeared like smoke in the sky, sunk like a stone on my own. A news crew, police, but no breakthrough. The search stops, still we move from place to place. The years they passed and I got used to his face. I mean, he keeps life okay, he's almost kind. No, I really don't think it's tricks of my mind. He treats me pretty good, but yes, I guess if I could, would have changed. The past would have run, but I froze, so I chose underwater. Down to the depths, the blue never knew I would stay for so long. Underwater, I rarely swim, I'm still, but the will to fight through all these waves. Do I have it in me? Am I close to free? Underwater. What happened when you went looking? You went Daddy, looking. what happened when I wasn't there? Wasn't you made thousands still interview, but did you even care? Even if care. I came out of the ocean, I'd be prodded and poked, soaked in the stairs. Just, just like the whale gill, just like the whale. I can hear them back to the father I chose to lose. Little girl, little girl, Away little from the man who gave me this bruise. The blame spins to shame. Maybe it's safer. I don't know, I can hear that. Yeah, just like a whale, yeah, just like a whale. Well. Can't come out, can I? No, I'd rather stay underwater. Never knew I would stay for so long. Wow. We got to shout out that graphic design from Brian Russell Carey. <laughs> Yay, Brian. We just have to really, really lean into the true crime and the like. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Kirsten is also so fantastic. She was in the last show that I just saw before the shutdown um, <clears throat> called Unknown Soldier. Playwright. Yes, she was fantastic. I think it only. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. She was in our new work series back in September, October, right? That's right. I also saw her as Eliza in My Fair Lady, and I was. Mm -hmm. I, I loved it. It was great. She's incredible. All right. Well, we have one more song from the show, so we'd love love to hear that. And we'd love to know more about it. Uh, sure. So this song is called Lost in the Panic and um, without giving too much away, because again, murder mystery, um, our protagonist Pete sings this song and um, his sister Maddie was one of the serial killer's victims. And so 
this song takes place at the very end of the show, like the second to last number. And so he sings this song to her ghost. Um, and he's essentially trying to make amends for how he handled his grief after her death. He utilized the media to his advantage in sort of a selfish way and um, accused someone of murder that maybe didn't deserve it and ultimately ran away and trashed a lot of his personal relationships that had previously meant a lot to him. Also, he didn't have to deal with his own pain and accountability where this tragedy was concerned. So this song in many ways, um, which is sung by the incredible uh, Jacob Dickey, it's his sort of moment of reckoning, if you will. So this is your 11 o'clock number. I, I guess, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, love it. <laughs> and do you have anything to add, Joe, or do we want to take it away? That was a brilliant intro. <laughs> well, so let's see Jacob then. What did I do to keep from missing you? What did I do to keep from missing you? I got lost in the panic, in the hysteria I made it my area of expertise. Needed a release from the truth as I knew it, couldn't do it. So I got lost in the panic. Cause the truth. I was the one who had to defy dad. I was the one who helped you sneak out. I was the one who betrayed Todd when all I had was a seed of doubt Cause I hate feeling like I've got nothing I hate feeling like I can't cope I hate feeling like I'll disappear So Dad was right, I used it all and got out of here I got lost in the panic, in the hysteria I made in my area of expertise. Convinced I'd find peace being ruthless, saying screw it, but I blew it. Walked past pain, when maybe I should have walked through it, but how to do it? How do I stop reshaping truth, climbing a ladder? How do I matter? Do I deserve to? Don't think I do. Caused more collateral damage than I can manage or make amends for. Can I settle this score? This debt that's allowed me to forget where I'm from. Cause if I'm not. Tell me what do I do to start missing you? What do I do to start missing you? Wow. Yay. <laughs> I know we're getting so much on this chat that we want to know more about these characters. Well, you're just going to have to see the show. I mean, from your lips to God's ears, right? Like, who wants mm -hmm. to do Forget Me Not? <laughs> you heard it here. When this quarantine is done, I've said this so many times now on this broadcast, there's so much art and development now that I hope has a place when this quarantine is over. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially when we have like amazing theaters and platforms like you all, like lifting us up. So hey. hey. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's very kind of you to say. Well, we think your piece is extraordinary, strange, and very special. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we are thank excited you. to see you next with the show. Thank well, you, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's our show for tonight. Join us next Wednesday, August 5th, same time, same place as always for our next new work series. And what's really exciting about our next series is it is all women and they are all members of the amazing Maestro Music, which you will learn more about next week. That's right. And we will feature excerpts from the new musicals, My Little Barbizon and Between the Lines. 
My Little Barbizon is written by the great Angela Scalfani, and Between the Lines is written by Kate Anderson, Elisa Samsel, and Timothy Allen McDonald. Between the Lines is also directed by our friend Jeff Calhoun. Thank you for tuning in tonight, and thank you for supporting live theater. Yes, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, and good night.